Have you ever had somebody do something for you and you tried to say thanks and as you articulated the words, you thought to yourself, I need to be able to do more than just words because words just don't seem to be sufficient. I want to do something to say thanks. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you're going to find Psalm 100 to be very helpful for you. You see, Psalm 100 was written to Israel to help them know how to worship. And specifically within their worship to know what to do in their thanks to God for what he had done for them. I invite you into Psalm 100 today to notice in verse 2 a little phrase. This little phrase will be the centerpiece of this passage and this morning's message. Look with me at Psalm 100 verse 2. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Hey, from where you're listening and watching today, could you say it with me? Serve the Lord with gladness. Tell you what, let's say it one more time. Serve the Lord with gladness. I so appreciate this little phrase because it's simple, it's understandable, and it's even memorable. So that as we make our way through this Sunday and we make our way into the next week, we can continue to demonstrate thanks according to Psalm 100 by serving the Lord with gladness. Now, one of the challenges that preachers of the word have is that sometimes God's word is very, very simple. And if we're not careful, we can complicate simple thoughts. So my prayer today as I present this message is that God would help me keep simple things simple. Now, in order to keep simple things simple, there's a simple outline today. As you look at this little phrase found in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, let's hang this passage on three words. Let, let's hang it first on the word what. Let's hang it secondly on the word who. And then thirdly on the word how. Let's hang this text on those three words and see if we can understand it today. What does this passage tell us to do? Well, note with me in the phrase of verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. You and I are to serve. Now, when we use the word serve, all kinds of images come into our mind. We think of someone serving in a restaurant to bring our food to a table or to refill our drinks. Maybe you have a New Testament picture of one on his knees, our Lord and Savior, washing the feet of his disciples. What I want to do today is to remove the images of serving out of our mind and replace them with a definition. This definition has served me very well, it served our family very well, and it may serve you well as well. Here's the definition, okay? In serving, we are giving all that we have with all of our heart all of the time. When we serve, we are giving all that we have with all of our heart, all of the time. A couple of key words in that definition, you see the word give. For at its very core, service is taking what I have and has been given to me and giving it back. When we give all that we have, we are giving away our time. We're giving away our um, talents and our abilities, our resources. And we are giving away what has been given to us. Now, in that definition, you'll also kind of identify the word all. It is giving all that I have. We're not being selective and saying some of this is mine and I'm giving this away. It is a giving away of all things with all of my heart. There's not a segment of our heart that we hold back and we only do it with this. It's with all of our heart and it's all of the time. We don't just serve on Sundays. We don't just serve on Mondays. We serve all of the time with all of our heart, with all that we have. We serve. Can I stop right here and just remind us of something? That the demise of a person or the demise of a church or a ministry always begins when that individual or that church or that ministry begins to exist solely for themselves. You and I must be very, very careful these days that we do not live solely for ourselves. 
Sometimes Satan loves to trick us and to say, well, you're not focused solely on yourself. You're focused solely on your family. Or you're solely focused on your work. Folks, you and I need to be solely focused on the Lord. Serving Him with all that I have, with all of my heart, all of the time. So this verse reminds us that in our thanks to God, we are serving the Lord with gladness. Now, let's hang these verses again on a second word. It's the word who. Who exactly is the object of our service? Note in the text it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Now, with that in mind, the psalm doesn't want to limit it to just verse 2. It wants to make sure that four out of the five verses reiterate to us the who of our service. And it's at this point that I want to read the whole psalm. Start with me in verse 1. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Now we come into verse 2. He's going to mention the Lord again. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. You and I are asked to serve the Lord. Now, who is the Lord? Again, look at the text, and would you note that in verse 3, the Lord, He is God. And if you're outlining this passage with me, let's take note of two things about the deity of of the Lord. Number one, He created us. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. Would you take note of this? Because the world is screaming the alternative or the opposite into your ears these days. There is no such thing as a self-made man. You and I were created by God. I have been surprised of late as I have read different passages introducing the Lord to us, in which immediately after the introduction of the Lord or of God, there is a reference that is made to His being a creator or the one who created all things. My takeaway from that has been that there are times in life when we think about God that we have to go back to the very beginning. Now, we know that God did not have a beginning, but creation did. And in the beginning of the Bible, the Bible reminds us that God created everything. Perhaps there's a lesson in that. Perhaps there's a principle in that, that a great place for us to always begin is that there is a God, and He created us. There's a New Testament cross-reference that would be handy for you to put in the margin of your Bible. In the margin of your Bible, go ahead and put Colossians 1, 16 through 18. Colossians 1, 16 through 18. Let's turn there in our New Testament. I want you to notice what it says. In verse 16, it says this, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Now, in verse 16, circle the word all, and then notice it says, all things were created by Him. Everything in existence today was created by God. Now look at the next verse. It says, He is before all things. In other words, there was one who existed before everything else existed. He was before all things, and that was God, the creator of all things. Notice the next phrase. And by Him all things consist. What that means is, not only has God created you and created me, He is keeping us alive right now. He is sustaining us. 
In my youth, I used to believe that the way a person passed away or died was that there was an angel of death, perhaps, that tapped on the shoulder of God and said, By the way, God, this individual's number is up. It is time for them to die. And in my mind's eye, mistakenly, I imagined that God said something like this, Die. Die die, and people passed away here on earth. But then you study a verse like this in verse 17, where it says that by him all things consist. We are taught that right now our hearts are beating, we are breathing, we are living because God in heaven is keeping us alive. We could picture it this way. Right this very moment, as you and I study this passage together, God in heaven is saying, live, 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 live. We are breathing and living right now because God, the creator of all things, is keeping us alive. In my youth, I thought that God said a word and we died. Colossians 1 teaches us it's not that God says a word, it's that God stops saying the word, live. So let me ask you a question. If God created us and God is keeping us alive right now, doesn't it make sense that I should take the life that I have been given and I live it as verse 16 says, All things were created by Him and for Him. We are to take the life that God created and is sustaining and we give it in service to Him. We take this life and we give all that we have with all of our heart, all of the time, to Him. Serve the Lord. He is God. He is our creator. Notice the second thing in the text. It says that he cares for us. In verse 3, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We don't have time to study it out, but would you go ahead and put it in the cross-reference section of your Bible, perhaps in the margin, Psalm 23. For Psalm 23 gives us this loving care of a shepherd over his sheep. And that's our God. He creates us, and He cares for us as a shepherd does his sheep. But the text isn't done, for it says in verse 5, there's something else about the Lord. Not only is He God, but secondly, He is good. It says in verse 5, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Now let's talk about God's goodness for a moment. There has never been a time in my life that I am more burdened for us to understand the goodness of God than right now. There are so many hard things and confusing things and and difficult things going on in the world and in your lives that now more than ever we need to be convinced that God is good. But what does that mean? Again, in my youth, I mistakenly believed that God's goodness was just one of many attributes of God. For instance, he's wise, he's just, um, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent. And I would slide in that list that God is also good. Now, his goodness is an attribute of God, but it is not just one of many attributes. It is the word that describes the perfect execution of all of God's attributes. I heard a man say it this way, and it was so, so helpful. If God was to get a report card and you were to list all of his attributes, he would make, because he is good, an A-plus in every single attribute. When it comes to his holiness, he has an A-plus. When it comes to his omnipotence, he has an A-plus. The fact that God gets an A-plus in every single attribute is because he is good. There is nothing about his attributes that could be done to improve them. God is good. 
Now, as you and I live, and even this week, we have seen the tentativeness of everything. Someone asked me recently, what are you doing next month? And I said, I don't know. I'm planning one week at a time because it just seems like everything keeps changing. And I want you to remember this. In the middle of all the tentativeness, God is always good. And that doesn't change. There are so many things that are happening around us that just keep changing, sometimes by the day. The goodness of God does not change. And in this text, it highlights two particular attributes of God that are really good. Note the first one, God is merciful. And it specifically says that His mercy is everlasting. That means that His mercy exists today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, and the next. And in God's mercy, it's that He does not give us what we deserve. Now think with me about this. There are some who are listening to this and you think, serve the Lord. I'm not worthy to serve the Lord. I mean, if you knew my past, if you knew what I did this week, if you knew what was happening in my head and in my heart, I, I'm a pretty big spiritual mess, we would say. But here's what is highlighted in this psalm. God's mercy is everlasting. And when it comes to His mercy, God is good, and there can be nothing done to His mercy that improves it. It's perfect. And because God is merciful to you and to me, it's not about whether or not I am worthy of serving the Lord. It's all about He is worthy of serving because He's been merciful to me and He's been merciful to you. There's another attribute that is highlighted here, and it's the idea of his faithfulness and his truth, who he is, the pure, for real, non-hypocrisy of God, the truth of who he is and what he does, it endureth. And you again see this everlasting aspect that it endureth to all generations. The truth of God is His faithfulness, the fact that He does not change, that He is consistent, that He is who He says He is, and He does what He said He would do. I like to say it this way. The faithfulness of God is the predictability of God. I can count on Him in my lifetime to be exactly who He says He is. And by the way, in my next generation of my offspring, my children and my grandchildren, they can count on God as well to be exactly who He says that He is. Serve the Lord with gladness. This Lord, He is God. He is also good. And He is good in His mercy and in His faithfulness. Sometimes an excuse is used on why we would not serve the Lord that we feel inadequate, that we don't have talents and abilities and resources to sufficiently serve God. But we don't serve God because we have all of this great stuff to give to God. We serve God with what we have. Because anything I'm lacking, He sufficiently fills. He's faithful. Now we come down to the end, and it's serve the Lord with gladness. We've talked about what you serve, the who, the Lord. But now we come to the how. With gladness. Now, I know that I'm talking to some weary people. I'm weary. I'm wore out and I'm tired as well. And in our weariness, we go, I just don't know if I can muster up enough joy. But God is not asking us to kind of put on a joyful face or to muster up some gladness. My dear friends, when you and I serve the Lord, one of the byproducts of serving the right one, the right way, is that we find joy. One of the telltale signs that we are serving the wrong way or serving the wrong one is that there's an absence of joy. We could say this way, there's an absence of noise. For in this psalm, there is a noise of gladness. It it says very clearly there that make 
a joyful noise. Can I ask you this? Has the noise of joy disappeared from your life? If that's the case, don't try to muster it up. Don't try to make it happen. Instead, let's ask the question, am I serving the right way and am I serving the right one? Joy is a byproduct of serving the right one. I have to be honest with you, there have been times over the last four months where I didn't have a whole lot of joy. In fact, I was kind of a grumpy Gus. I, I like to say it too, that I was a grumpin'. You say, what is grumpin'? Well, grumpin' is a word I came up with to describe when the noise of my complaint has kind of spilled out over onto the look of my face. Maybe there's some children who are watching this and you've been a grumpin' this morning. You were complaining with your mouth and it kind of spread out and overflowed onto the look on your face. We're grumpin'. And I've been a grumpin' at times. I've been a grumpy Gus. I had an absence of gladness and joy. And every single time, it wasn't because of the circumstances, though they were difficult and hard. It was because I had begun to serve the wrong way. Or I was serving the wrong one. Serve the Lord with gladness. As I conclude today, I, I recognize there perhaps is a mom who is watching this or listening to this and uh, gathered around you are your children and they're clamoring for your attention and you're needing to take care of them and you're looking up and around and you see a house full of work. And this whole text, in a sense, it just overwhelms you because you are so weary, so tired. Just the simple phrase, serve the Lord with gladness, overwhelms you. Maybe there's a dad, you're, you're balancing work responsibilities and working harder than you ever have before. You're now working at home, and so in addition to working at home, you're trying to take care of some things around the house, serve your wife, serve your family. And the whole concept of serving the Lord with gladness actually just overwhelms you. Maybe I'm just talking to somebody today who you are spiritually, physically, and emotionally tired. Where do we get the strength to go on? To which I want to close with a really interesting phrase that finds its way in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10. Listen to the last words and just let them encourage you. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's a neat principle. When you and I serve the right way, the right one, a byproduct is joy. And in that joy that God gives, we find a fuel to endure. We find a fuel for our strength. When God refills the tank of a person to give them the energy to go on, it's the fuel of joy that comes when we serve the right one the right way. Serve the Lord with gladness. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would help each one of us to do this. Help us to serve the right one the right way and to begin with your help to experience the joy of the Lord that becomes our strength. Thank you in a midst of a world where everything seems to keep changing. You are consistently good. We cling to that characteristic of yours, and we find great hope in it. And we pray that with that hope and with your strength, we would endure and stay faithful for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Can I ask you to stop real quick? Can I give you something that is completely extra today? It's free of charge, I would say. There's no charge for this, but it's something that's sitting on my heart that I just need to share with you. Because what I'm watching is that there are a lot of people in our church and who are watching this who are right on the brink of making some really, really big decisions. You're, you're thinking about churches. You're thinking about where you live. You're thinking about your job. Some are thinking about their marriage. 
There might even be one who is thinking about their life. And you're right on the brink of making decisions, whether you stay with your spouse, you get another job, you quit your job, maybe even if you take your life. I want you to think of the word halt or stop. I want to encourage every one of us before you make any big decisions to halt. And what I mean by that is to take the word halt and to take each of those letters and remember something. Let the H represent hurt. If you are hurting, you're not in a good place to make a big decision. Halt. Let's say that it's that you're an angry person right now. Somebody has done something and, and you are just very, very emotionally charged in anger. If you are angry right now, you're not in a good place to make a big decision life-changing decision. The L represents lonely. If you and I find ourselves in a really, really lonely place, we're disconnected from family, we're disconnected from church, we're disconnected from friends, you're in a very dangerous place to be making major life decisions. Hurt, anger, loneliness, and then you have the T, you're just tired. There are some people who are working now more than ever before. You're not sleeping well. You are tired. If you are tired today, just physically, emotionally, spiritually, halt. You're not in a great place to make major life decisions. Before we make those decisions, let's address the hurt. Let's address the anger. Let's connect ourselves with other people and receive counsel. Maybe you're just tired and you need a couple days of rest before you make any major decisions. Halt. Don't make them until you've addressed those other things. Here at Faith Baptist Church, we'd love to help you. If you're right on the brink of major decisions and you need counsel, let us know. It would be our privilege to help you. In the meantime, it is the Lord's Day. I trust that you'll have a wonderful day. And may each of us serve the Lord with gladness. Lord bless you.